Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast show with me, Michael Tinkster. We are on a mission to share what Maverick leaders know and do to build businesses that deliver strong results and positive impact on people, society, and the planet. Thank you to our brand partner, BizSimply, for sponsoring this episode. BizSimply is the all-in-one workforce management software that enables your business to become more efficient and profitable. The software designed and built by hospitality experts to enhance the way shift-oriented operators manage their business, optimize their entire people journey, and making every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, how we grow, and how we serve our customers. Together, we wanted to share strategies and tools to make the industry thrive long term. It's very much a personal thing, as in it's a how you are as a person and how you carry yourself and how you are with your teams, uh, understanding your teams, treating them differently, as in in the sense that people are different, so they need to be treated differently. People have different needs to feel part of a team or respect them and have empathy for them and, and show interest in, in them as people. This is Rie katrup UK Head of Food for Ole and Steen, the Danish bakery, which here in the UK is known for being the home of the cinnamon social. Rie has been breeding and living the industry from an early age and has over the years worked for some amazing brands like Wagamama, White Bread, Bill's Restaurants. And it was amazing to have a fellow hospitality Dane on the show. And in this conversation, we discuss her incredible journey as a chef food development and how she has developed her leadership skills over the years and why hospitality is a great place to work. There's a big shout out to Hospitality Rising in this conversation. We also have a deep dive into how you build a great team in your kitchen and what female leadership can bring to optimize performance in the kitchen and much more. If you liked today's episode, it will mean the world to me if you could leave a review of the show on our website Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The better the views, the better the guests, and ultimately, the better the learning is for you. Now, dear Maverick, run, grab your notebook and coffee. This is a great conversation about all things hospitality and leadership. Enjoy. Today, I will be joined by a, a fellow Dane, which is a not the first time on the show, but it's the first time I have a female chef that's from Denmark on the uh, on the show. And uh, we met a couple of months ago uh, as part of we had to be on a panel together. Or I was moderating a panel and we was on it as a great panel expert. Uh, and I said straight away after I heard her story, that story needs to be shared with the with you guys out there with the audience. Uh, so we had a bit of a, a chat about what could actually be the vision for this conversation. And, you know, there was like definitely some insights into the journey about uh, how a female chooses to become a chef in a very male dominated world. But also like what can actually, uh, how can it actually be that she's actually been there for so many decades and they actually she's still there and she's still doing an impact and she works and have worked for some really, really interesting brands out there so with that said welcome to the show Rie. it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here as well so thank you Rie, for, for people out there i think as i already mentioned like the, the journey you've been on like where you decide i'm going to become a chef and then you end up working from great businesses like wakamama etc etc can you tell a bit about those early days where you made the decision to to join hospitality yeah, definitely. I think I've, I've, my story is probably a bit different, I would think, because I actually started working in hospitality when I was 13. Um, I think I wanted a N Nintendo game or something. And my mom said to me, if that's the case, I, I suggest you go and get yourself a job. So that was kind of how it started. So I, had, I started as a dishwasher as a 13-year-old in a cafe in Denmark. Um, and I, I did not get off to the greatest start because I think I think I lasted about a few weeks and then I went to my boss and said, she was female as well, which is interesting. I went to her and said, I don't think this is for me. I mean, it, it's too much stress. I, I can't do it. And she let me go. And then she called me up a week later and said, um, are you sure you don't want to come and give it another 
gave it another try. And I said, oh, right, okay, yeah, sure. Um, so I went back and then I ended up working for her for like 10, 15 years, as in I did all sorts of things with her. So that was kind of my first my first job and my first kind of introduction to the craziness of hospitality. Um, so I worked for her for, as I said, like many, many years doing catering, front of house, back of house, all sorts of things. Um, and then I went to university because that's kind of what you do. Um, and started um, at Copenhagen University studying sports science. Um, I went to another university after that. I only lasted there about six months. Um, then I went to another university, studied um, communication, and then realized at some point to myself after being at university a few years that hospitality um, seemed like a much better idea than trying to take get all these degrees. Um so I then went in and um, trained to become a chef. Um, during all my time in, in university, I still worked in hospitality and in restaurants um, for summer holidays and all sort of things. So I never quite let go of it, which also meant that when I wanted to train to become a chef, I could skip a lot of the practical side of becoming a chef, a chef and be, do the school bit of it. So I, I took a bit of a shortcut in the end just because I had so much experience. Um, and then graduated, became a chef, um, got my first job at Tivoli Gardens, which is kind of like, it seems like a long story, but there, there is a point, which is that I started with Tivoli Gardens um, and did a season with them. And then they came to me and said, when the season is, is over, we really like you to stay with us. We are, um, we've got the franchise for this concept, UK concept called Wagamama. And I'd never heard about it, no idea what it was, no idea what I was getting myself into. But they said to me, um, we're going to send you to London for six weeks and train. And I thought, brilliant. Six weeks in London with everything paid. That sounds that sounds ideal. Um, so I went off and did six weeks of training here in London, which was very different to any of the other kitchens I've ever worked with in Denmark. It's, it's just a very different culture is different and the people you work with which is kind of like a theme in hospitality is that you meet all these people from all over the world which was what I was just thrown into um so I had a great six weeks in London went back and opened Wagamama in Denmark and then was selected to go and help open the first one in the U.S. so I went to Boston for about six eight weeks as well and helped open Wagamama in Boston um and that kind of gave me the sense that I want to do, I want to do more of bigger things. I want to be not just a head chef as I was at the time in Denmark. Um, and if I wanted to kind of move up the ranks and get like uh, do openings and do more, just involved in a bigger business, I would have to move to London. I wouldn't have to move to London, but I wanted to stay with Wagamama because that was a base, and I really enjoyed working for them and thought it was a great business. So I came over to London, kind of transferred from Wagamama in Denmark to Wagamama over here. Um, as everyone else, it was only supposed to be a year or two years. And now it's been 15, like everyone else. I think everyone says that. Um, so Wagamama was kind of what got me into it, um, staying here and kind of moving up. When I first became a chef, I thought it was, I, I thought I was going to be like a chef forever I was going to work in kitchens as as you kind of normally do when you become a chef I didn't necessarily in the beginning have that vision of moving up that was purely Wagamama and it was training in London it was going to Boston that I kind of realized there's there's a bigger picture here that I can do more things than work in the same place in a restaurant um, for most of my career so that really helped me think that I can do other things there's so much more to hospitality than being a head chef and, and running a kitchen. So that was very key for me to um, to make that as in visualizing and start manifesting that I wanted to do more than than being a head chef. You mentioned uh, the lady they, they owned the cafe that came back and pulled you back into to, to the hospitality world. Uh, is she like also very like a rock of the reason why you are in hospitality because there was somebody that took you under your wings at a very early, early stage and learned the, the uh, you know, the the ups and downs and the 
ABC of hospitality. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she's she. It was a great business. She only had one little cafe, but we we, we made a lot of money, and it, it it was a very busy place. Um, but also the fact that she kind of saw she must have seen something in me, or she was really short of staff. I don't really know. But anyway, she she nevertheless she called me up, and and I, I guess she saw something in me, saying, "Come back, let, let's give it another try." And um, she was she was a great businesswoman, and her background wasn't even hospitality. That she's done all sorts of other things, um, but her way of running that business, and it was a very young team and all that. It, it, I had so much fun doing that job, and as I said, I worked for her for years and years. Um, but that whole being really busy and sticking together and working as a team, and at the same time have a lot of fun, um, that definitely kind of um, started all the way back many many years ago. So. It, it was a great start uh, by coincidence that that happened, but um, I have lots of very fond memories from from that time. Um, so that was definitely a, a key as well. Do you think there is like one leadership trait you're taking with from her, as you has become, you're risen in the ranks, have got more responsibility? Can you see that you are doing some of the same things, or not? Probably not that much because again it it was her own little business her own little baby and she only had that one she had no intention of of having more than that one but the 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 leadership and the fact that she was a business owner probably now that i think of it had a bigger impact i think than i've thought of before but just the fact that she was a female very successful businesswoman um in hospitality um was quite as in she she was great. Well, she is. She's still alive. She's she's still great. Um, but no, I think definitely she she probably was a bit of a role model, even though I've never really thought of it that way. But definitely an inspiration of of a very successful and strong minded businesswoman. I mean, you didn't mess with her at all, which was um, which was great and probably part of why she was so successful. Uh, she sounds very very stoic i would say um as a, as a really big fan of stoic philosophy that you also if you can see something in people you have to go back and try to get them involved that's very much like uh, you heard those stories before in hospitality where somebody sees something in someone and they mentor them to go on their own and do whatever they need but can you also tell the audience a bit like what what happened after wakamama and what you uh up to what you're doing today and what would your role is right now as well? Yeah, well, I think, again, once I kind of made the decision to come to London and made that move, I had a very clear vision of why I was doing that. I wasn't just coming to London for fun or because I could. I kind of like, there's, there's a very specific reason why I come to London, and that's because I can't get that type of job in Denmark that I think I want, which was doing openings. Um, so I came to London, I was kind of like, I really want to do openings. And I didn't. I knew a few people over here from Wagamama, but I didn't know the wider team of Wagamama here. But when I look back, I was very clear straight from the beginning. Whenever I had the chance to speak to more senior people, I kind of manifested saying, "I'm I'm I'm here for a reason. I want to be an area chef. I want to do openings. I want to do more. I'm not here to be a head chef because I could have stayed in Denmark if that was the case." So I was very kind of clear every time I had like five minutes with someone more senior. I was very clear on saying. This is why I'm here. I want more. I want more. I want more. Well, I want to work towards getting, achieving more and be recognized for pushing and being good. Um, so with Wagamama, I, I ended up being an area support chef. Um, and the last year and a half with them, I've traveled around and opened restaurants. So I've opened about like 15 Wagamama restaurants across UK, Boston um, and, and Denmark, obviously. Um, and then after that, um i was lucky enough to go so th- i think a, a lot of the time you need someone to again mentor you or see a potential in you to take to do the move from being operations being part of the front line running restaurants and someone seeing a potential for you to move out of it um and and I, someone I, i've worked with a few times in different businesses saw that potential in me to become a development chef um, and do more um, development stuff. So I then was offered a job um, at Whitbread, which is obviously a massive business and very different to Wagamama to become um, a development chef. So that was my first move out of being on the ground um, in operations 
Um, and again, owe a lot to someone seeing a potential in me and say, you know what, I think you could do really well as a development chef. Um, so I worked for Whitbread for a few years doing um, development across their brands and their um, Premier Inn Hotel. Um, and after, I think, about three and a half years with them, I was um, got offered the job as executive development chef with Bill's Restaurants. And again, um, a very different business um, to, to Whitbread and, and the other ones. But still, it's I've always done casual dining. I've, I've never necessarily been that much... Um, into fine dining or anything like that. So I've always kind of stuck with casual dining. Um, did bills for a few years as well. Um, done a few other things in between, um, a few other businesses. And then now I am um, head of food of um, the Danish bakery chain, um, Ole and Steen, which is um, kind of looped around to come come around, doing lots of international and UK businesses here. And then um, now I'm with with a Danish business, which is um, fun and a very different challenge, and and feels good after so many years over here to actually be part of something very Danish, and kind of the traditions and um, the whole culture around Denmark, and and obviously it's a bakery, so that that's that's fun to be part of that, and um, a, a great business to to be part of, and just fun to be part of something Danish and rolling out a Danish brand that's proving to be quite successful over here. So that's, that's, that's great. And that's, that's where I'm at now. Yeah. And also because there's not many Danish food and restaurant successes. There is of course, all and Steen, as you mentioned, and then there's Joe and the Jews. There's really have been able to scale outside Denmark significantly. There's others that have tried as well, but that's really, I, I totally agree. That's one of the, one of the few you, you can join. But I have to ask you because uh, to, to to get you to know you a bit better because you're a chef and you love food and I know that. So what what is your favorite dish and uh, and uh, and then and, and you like to cook of course and eat and and why? Well, I think I'm not sure I have a specific dish, but I do just I mean I love getting people over f- and cook any sort of um, food for people and just have having people around. I'll I'll see something. Um, on Instagram or been out to a restaurant and tried something or had something I thought, Oh, that's great. I want to try and make that. Um, so I, I think if, if I'm not sure I can say a specific dish, but I can say anything that's kind of like low and slow or kind of like cooking a roast. I love cooking a roast. I love having people over for a roast, which is very on Danish, but I absolutely love cooking a roast, um, and just have people around. I just really enjoy cooking for people. Um, I don't get to do that much anymore at work as such, but I love ha- having dinner parties and cook Sunday roast and those sort of things. Um, so comfort, comfort food is probably the the category. Yeah, well, that's also very Danish, isn't it? Like some very comfort food. You all sit down and you have a shared meal around. That's like, it takes me back to my, my, my childhood as well. Uh, 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 when my mom had time to we were often eating food that came from the restaurant. So I'll be totally honest. I was very, I had a very good childhood when it comes to food. Um, what, 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 uh, how do you, because you work as a development chef, how do you actually keep up to date with all the trends? Because one of the things probably the audience want to know, what is the next thing that are coming, but also how do you actually as a development chef keep on involving yourself and actually keep on, have the innovation and the insights you need to, to come up with the right things? Yeah, I think, I mean, I go out a lot and I find myself going to a restaurant and look at the menu and I kind of think, oh, I really want a burger. But then I think I should really look at this other dish instead because I'm quite intrigued about an ingredient or or the sound of the dish. So quite often when I go out to a restaurant, I end up eating not the dish I necessarily really want to eat, but the dish I think that sounds most interesting. Um, And then I pick up, it can be textures or colors or a specific ingredient um, where I think, oh, that's really cool, or that's that's interesting, or you can do things with it. Um, and then I kind of hate to say it, but at the same time, maybe not. But Instagram, I mean, just looking at pictures of food on Instagram. And again, I'll, I'll pick up something from a picture more than a recipe. So I, I see a picture and kind of can gather, or sometimes I'm very wrong. I think I see something in the picture, and then when I read what it is, I'm kind of, oh, I didn't think it was that. But I've, 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 it sparked something in me, either, again, what it looks like 
the textures or a specific ingredient or something like that where I kind of like um, start my bra- my brain then starts thinking, oh, what could this be turned into with the setup we have and how we do things? So rarely can I kind of completely copy something, um, but I, I pick things from it and, and try and turn it into how um, how that would work in, in the business that I work in um, to adapt it to either teams or kitchens or capacity capabilities and that sort of thing what what about it's like is there like one to two trends right now you think as a you know a chef or a food business you really need to to look into and be aware of to to meet the consumer and what they want obviously here within the last few years i've been less obviously in restaurants working in restaurants and more into the bakery so it's very much kind of in the treats and indulgence and kind of like um, not necessarily main meal business that I'm in at the moment. But I think people are getting more and more used to bakeries. And there's definitely, even though they are calorie counting um, and um, eating healthy, um, people still from time to time just want a treat. They want to go into a cafe, have a nice cup of coffee, not worry about calories and just have a really good quality cake or bun or whatever it is. So I think people are healthy and, and getting healthier and, and really trying, but there, there, there will always be a need for the treat and, and something comforting. Um, and I think as a Danish bakery, we try to kind of balance between doing things that are very Danish, but at the same time, pick on pick, pick up things that are, are trendy over here and kind of turn it into a Danish version of something that is, um, traditionally English again that can be a flavor or or a specific type of cake or whatever but we do a twist on it um so it's not so specific to to your question but more around um a feeling and that sort of thing around um food and treats and treating yourself to something nice and a bit of me time sort of thing yeah how, how because it's quite interesting because things also with uh you know we're a bit in a financial crisis people call it different things but in principle it's a financial crisis where people are counting the pennies and i guess when people want to that's how i feel myself when i'm going out now i'm very careful what i choose but also i want to treat because it's a it's a break from all the hustle and bustle and surviving in principle in my work or i just want to disconnect and that's why i'm, I'm totally okay with that i can eat healthy at home I know that I go out actually to have a treat in a way. And I think that's, that's spot on when you're talking about that. But how do you actually take, you know, when you have these ideas, and I think lots of people think about how do you get from the idea of a really great dish then to actually make it real in the kitchen and make it work because or in the bakery in, in, in this connection and it has to work and sell out in the stores, you know. It can be the most brilliant idea, but it fails to implement at some point for some reason but what what was like your experience when it goes really well and you do that process really well from your really great idea from a creative point of view to it's executed in the same way with the same consistency day in and out yeah no just in general it's just great i remember the first time i ever had a dish on a menu which again was just some sort of vision and some sort of oh my god i can't imagine what it would be like for other people to cook my food and customers to buy it and eat it and enjoy it and then sometimes you forget a little bit that you've developed something and then you have a team that cook it and then you have customers who enjoy eating it um, but it's, it's such a satisfaction but I probably don't think about it enough as in that kind of feeling it gives you and that sense of achievement um, that being said it's again the business I'm in now is a bit different because um a lot of the food is salad and sandwiches um, that gets made in our um, central production unit. So that's all at the moment is, is pretty much a 24 hour um, operation. So all the bakers would bake all the breads for us and then it would go to the central kitchen and then they will make the sandwiches. Um, so all our sandwiches are like no more than 12, 12 hours old. It, it gets made overnight by freshly baked bread in freshly baked bread, which is just great. So there are some limits and um around what you can do and it is a challenge to develop things that um are not too complex for the team so we get consistency we now have 26 bakeries um and to to have a team making um all our sandwiches consistently across 
um, when they make that amount of sandwiches that we do, um, it, it needs to be not too complex and there needs to be not too many steps in it and all that. So th- there are definitely some challenges around that. That being said, I, I think I've kind of convinced both the, te- the team in Denmark and the team over here to say we don't need to create really fancy, um, innovative fillings for our sandwiches because we are bakery and our our main ingredient is the bread and people come to us for the bread and the quality of the sandwiches that we produce um so we we can probably get away with slightly simpler good quality filling but people come to us because it's it's baked in fresh bread as in it's made in in freshly made rolls and really good quality bread um so i do twists on things but I don't overcomplicate it because it's it's difficult to get consistency on it, um, and um, I'm not sure it's always necessary to to do really fancy, um, innovative things that people no, don't always understand. We just recently launched, and I knew it was going to sell um, a Caesar sandwich in a rye bread in rye bread instead of in white bread, and it's really well. And I just knew it would because it just does. <laughs> um, so it also comes from experience that you kind of know what is going to work and what isn't. Not say you're always right, because I have had times where I thought this is not going to work and it did or the other way around. Um, but for us, the key is the quality of our, our bread that gets baked and crafted every night in the bakery. And that that's that's a POS for us. It's, it stands out that all our bread is fresh and made overnight pretty interesting thing when you're focusing on less but better ingredients as well you get a lot of taste and actually lots a lot of good eating experience for for the end use and often that's how simple food is just think about the italian or the mediterranean diet it's not very complex food in principle it's not it is very simple and you know what's in there there's maybe onion tomatoes and one more ingredients and you have a delicious uh meal um I wanted to talk a bit about you today as well, Lee, about because you were also striving for that leadership position and you got that and you have been in leadership position where you have been, been running teams and, you know, how do you approach? Because uh, as a as a, a female, you probably approach leadership a bit different than, than male. That's definitely my experience because the best boss is I've had. It's no, no, it's not barking up a tree, but it has been women uh, because they, they, they do something else that men doesn't do and that's uh and uh, what was so, so I'd like to hear could we unpick some of your you know your special source of building a great team in the kitchen or a great team around you when you go in and take a leadership position yeah i don't i mean i don't know if it's like a female trait necessarily um but listening and empathy and treating people with respect and all that the, the, these days, most people do that. So I don't know if that's specifically for a, like a female leader, but for any leader, regardless of male or female, I think the key is that you work with your teams and you listen to them and you respect them and you understand them and you work with them on the ground, which is always when I've had the best results with teams is if I'm part of what they do and they see me go in and get stuck in and and I'm not too good for doing dishes or mopping the floor or whatever it is. So I think that goes for males and females. I don't think it's one or the other. But I has my journey been different? It probably has, but I'm probably blissfully ignorant to how it could have been had I been a male. And I'm I'm quite I think I've done pretty well and I've had some great people as mentors and, and leading me and um helping me get to where I am so I think it's very much a personal thing as in it's a how you are as a person and how you carry yourself and how you are with your teams uh, understanding your teams treating them differently as in in the sense that people are different so they need to be treated differently people have different needs to feel part of a team or some a lot of younger staff might quite like the feeling of being part of like it's a work family sort of thing um so people need to be younger staff sometimes need to be treated quite differently to someone that's been around for a long time um so it's understanding your teams and and 
respect them and have empathy for them and and show interest in in them as people. Um, so I'm not sure if that's more a female than a male, but it's it's lots of being it's being there's a lot more focus on it these days to 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 treat people better and and um, respectful, uh, be more respectful in in our industry. Yeah, I think it's just like it's a patient thing as well. There's more, more patient. You have to have more patient with people, and you need to take them on the journey. But what, what uh, if we had like uh, somebody joining us to call now? Was so your for one of your former employees? What, 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 what do you think? Like, if I said to them, what is a Ria's number one trait as a leader? What is it like she's really excel at? What would you say? You think? Well, I think I've always been um, very clear with my teams on what is expected. I mean, I'm very black and white with how we do things and we stick to the rules and we stick to the processes. Um, it's black and white, what's right and wrong. They, my teams have always been very clear on what's right, what's wrong, but I have never, ever been um, disrespectful or um, they know what, what, I'm, what, what I'm expecting from them. I think a lot of the time that's part of why people don't perform as well or people get a bit frustrated or lose motivation is because they're not entirely sure what what the main thing what's the main goal and what is it we're trying to achieve here and if they can see your passion and your um that you're doing the right thing and you show up and you push for it they they, they will jump jump with you so i think um i think the team would say that yeah i'm, I'm black and white um but i'm definitely um um respectful and people know where they have me as in I'm, I'm not I'm pretty straightforward is probably probably the word so I can come across a bit harsh but it's it's no hard feelings at least you know where what what I'm thinking as in what what you see is what you get sort of thing it's really interesting because like clear clear direction and expectations are actually some most people are hunger for in when you ask them why they leave a business or job was they they feel lost in a way so it's really interesting you talk about that but what what has been like as a leader you know the, the last couple of years has been a crazy time we've gone through what has been your most significant learning what kind of reflection have you had yourself uh, because we're still going through some huge challenges in the industry and that of course impacts your leadership style and how you see things as a leader yeah i think um Work-life balance has changed, but not just within the last, even more so the last two years, but it started even before that. When I first came to the country, people couldn't work enough hours, as in no one, as in people coming to the country came here to work, and they didn't care about days off or holiday, um, they just wanted to work. Where I feel that that has changed, and as I said, even more so the last two years, people um, want to have a good life as well. They want to have a better work-life balance um, they want to enjoy themselves when they're off they want time off and um, that's that's I think that's very important now and it, it becomes more and more important for for teams to have that balance that has and again it comes back to hospitality and the toughness of it and and how it, that's how it's always been that you work long hours um, but one it's not necessarily necessary you can work around not working ridiculous hours um, and people are not up for it anymore, which is fair because it, it's not a way to to live like that, that working hours like that and standing up in a stressful environment. So I think work-life balance is definitely um, a lot high on the agenda. And we have to remember, hospitality staff cannot work from home. There's no such thing. When they're at work, they're at work. And and um, so, so we need to look after them when they're there and we need to... Um, give them benefits in other ways because, as I said, they, they can't work from home and, and do a bit of laundry during the day sort of thing. So it, it's it's important that there's um, better benefits and, and just better environment for, for them to work in. That We need to keep up in that way with hospitality because it's it's not easy. It's tough out there. Well, like connection with that, you said it's tough out there. What do you think? Like, is the biggest challenge for for hospitality right now? What if if you were, uh, what brings staff? Yeah, which I'm sure is what everyone says. But one thing is that it's a bit of a disaster not to have the staff. But it's also such a shame because that's part of what made hospitality such a great place was 
the individuals and the different cultures and people coming together and work together as a team, regardless of where you were from or who you were. And we lost that along with losing most of our staff. So it, it's from it being just in general, very difficult to find staff. We've, we've also lost a lot of what hospitality was because of, of all the different people coming together and working together. Um, that's, that's, that's a big shame, I think, that it's come to that. It's quite interesting yeah, because that's actually what makes the, the industry, I can remember myself as well, quite unique is the, uh, the, uh, you know, the amount of different people you meet, especially in your, in your younger years and in your formative years, but actually and what that does on your world view as well, if you are lucky to have an international experience i think that's really really interesting I haven't thought about it that way before but i can totally see that because actually that's some of the mystique some of the alch- alchemy that hospitality had where actually you didn't have to do anything but now actually it lost a bit of that and now it has to fight what what, what do you think is, is there like some things do you think that really is important that we get done as an industry like that we need to solve to to get maybe that back or solve the the crisis around staff yeah well i think there's um, hospitality rising doing a lot of work to try and fix it with what we've got. As in, instead of sitting waiting for politicians to reverse what has been done sort of thing, which is probably not going to happen, um, hospitality rising are really trying to figure out what, what can be done and we've got what we've got. We need to find a way to to work with it and we need to attract um, people from this country um, into it. Um, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, one thing we can't do is sit and wait for someone else to try and fix it for us because that that that's obviously not going to happen. So, um, what the answer is, I don't really know. I'm not too close into um, how to fix it or or what can be done. Or I'm, I'm sure it's just very unlikely that things get opened up to allow people in to work. Um, I'm, I keep hoping and thinking at some point they must allow people to come in and work for hospitality because otherwise it won't work but I, I, I doubt that will ever be the case. I really liked that you said that we can't sit and wait for somebody else solving the problem we need actually to get involved and do the work ourselves and improve the gaps we actually are in control of and not focusing on what we're not in control of and I think that's a there's, there's, there's two different camps as I see it right now. There's the, 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 the people are very proactive trying to solve it. And then there's people saying it's the fault of the government. But yeah, they are probably going to move in five years time when it's too late to move. So be, better just find the, the solution yourself. Yeah, no. And I think because um, the staff have become so much younger, um, partly as in from, from this country. So the way you induct them and interview them and train them is completely different to how it used to be because you would deal with much older and much more experienced people where now you get really young people in and you have to acknowledge the fact that they are completely different as in their background is different and it's their first job um, so a lot of the work is probably around how how we interview and induct and train these really young people which is very different and unusual for us to rely on on that um, group um, of people as such, which I think is a lot of the work as well. And that's a bit interesting because I have a, a long history in McDonald's, and that's actually what we we learned over time. We were helping people into their first job, and if we got those first three months right, where they actually felt that they were getting the skills to do a job well, because a lot of times when you hit your first job. You're just an absolutely, uh, you are, ra- you know, you are rabbit in headlights. You know, you don't know what you're doing. You don't even know how to say hello when you come to work. That's it. That's where we are sometimes. If, if you didn't have a, some parents that was very good at learning you the the skills of that, but very much this is the first time they're in contact with the real world where there's not a book or some kind of other performance they have to do academic, they actually have to navigate around and how to be in a team with customers and so on. So I think that's a huge, huge task there. And it's not, not an easy, easy one because uh, it takes time to change your systems for, for that as well. 
coming back a bit to you and your journey as well, uh, Uri, so you are you're a female chef and leader in the hospitality industry. But have you faced any challenges on that journey? Because it sounds like it's gone quite well, and there's lots of stories. Sometimes it's difficult to be a chef, especially a female chef. Well, the the again, whether you're male or female, it's not an easy job. I mean, it's 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 hard work, and it's it's a lot of long hours and standing up and physically hard work putting away deliveries just as an example which doesn't seem as much but if you do that every morning um, it's it's hard work but I think as we have talked about a little bit before as well I think I've I've had a pretty good run I haven't had any um, unpleasant experiences as such Um, I think also from from my background and from um, being Danish, we're very direct and we're very straightforward. So people probably don't try and play those sort of games with me, if I can call it that. As in, they're, they're kind of like, oh, I better not mess around with her because um, she's a bit tough. And it's not to be tough, that's just the culture I'm from and that's just how we are as, as Danish people. So I think some of the kind of like people holding back probably comes from my my attitude and my how I am as a person. Um and I had a thought the other day as well, which was, I think some, I, I, again, obviously work with people from, from all over the world and, and also work with people that would come from countries which might um, have less respect for women or come from a very different culture where the male-female kind of um, relationship is very different. Um, and then I've had staff that would um, ask me out or send me flowers or, or be sort of, um, a bit inappropriate, but they didn't come from a bad place. I mean, they were good people. They just came from a culture that was so different. So they didn't, they didn't try to be um, inappropriate or disrespectful. But that was just their background, and they were really good people. And as soon as you kind of have the chat with them and say that's not quite appropriate where we are, and and I don't kind of appreciate, and you have a like respectful conversation with them about it. It was fine, and we carried on, and there were no hard feelings. But I think a lot of those people, they most definitely don't do it to be disrespectful or inappropriate. They they just that's their culture. Um, they were good people. They were really good people. As in, there was nothing. Um, they just were trying to figure out how to do things, and probably thought they were being quite nice. Um, it was just um, not quite the right thing to do and they didn't know and then you have a chat about it and carry on that's super interesting is the the whole uh, the mindset of not judging judging people as well Uh, and i think it's really really important skill especially in hospitality we have so many different people you can easily also we both come from denmark that's a there is a danish way of doing things that doesn't work in the international world for example we need you need to learn as a dane as you come out and being direct is great but also you need sometimes to not all cultures are ready for that uh the the, the danishness as i call it um so what what advice would you give because i also know you would like to see more female leaders and chefs and so on what advice do you have like to in, uh, to people that aspire to become leaders or female leaders or chefs that want to join the industry um i think i think it's um again as i said my, my journey has has been pretty smooth but i've also I've, I've done a lot to make it clear what it was after and as i said manifesting kind of like what my goal is and what I'm what I'm going for um and I think that's important and that's again whether you're male or female um and then in general if it's I think it's just great to get more females in in kitchens whether it's like as a head chef or in a management role um it completely changes the dynamics of of a kitchen as soon as you've got females in the kitchen. When I joined Wagamama and when I first came to the country, there were I worked in a few kitchens that didn't have a single female um, in the kitchen. And I would be the first almost. Um, and then I would have teams of, of men and boys. And as soon as I got like some females in, the, the, it just changed. And it changed for the better because the dynamics just changed. And, and it might sound like contradictive, but the males kind of came down a little bit, as in they were a bit more not as rowdy or not as banter between them as soon as females 
and came into the kitchen. So it is just great to have a mix of people and a mix of um, managers um, of of different, as in males and females. And I also think a lot of the time in hospitality, you would have front of house that's very female led. And then you will have back of house that's very male led. And then you would just clash just because of um, males and females and the kitchen would feel that front of house were after them and front of house would feel that the kitchen didn't understand and there would be a lot of that and that would be as well because there's such a divide maybe not so much anymore but there used to be a massive divide that back of house were all the all the guys and at the front you had all the girls and that created a bit of tension and a bit of um yeah tension is probably the best word to describe it I think as well so the more you get a mix in both camps the better it gets yeah, and it's interesting in the di- diversity of the, the team is also it, it gives the cohesiveness of uh, the performance. And I think, yeah, it, it, the, the question is how do we actually make it attractive for them to come in there? Because there is this myth about working in back of house, where actually where I learned most about hospitality was in always in the back of house, because it is the difficult bit. That's where all the pressure is, the kitchens. And actually then you knew really appreciate when you're in the front of a house what it takes to get the dish from ingredients to you so you can serve it at the table and i think that's what one of my biggest learning as well what is um what is um how do you um show up every day and do your best uh, be the best version of yourself because like uh, it's one of the questions i think is quite intriguing we all have different ways to 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 face today and be the best version of yourself what is what is your secret I mean, it's going to sound really boring and I don't, it's as in, I, um, I really like routines when it comes to my personal life and how I live at home. So, um, getting to the gym, getting enough sleep, having my morning coffee, all those sort of things. I'm quite, I wouldn't say strict, but I like routine when it comes to at home. And then I can much better deal with all the chaos that comes as soon as I get to work. Um, just because I, I need those sort of go to bed at the same time at night and have my whatever hours of sleep and um, doing those things massively helped me to deal with the pressures and and the stress of getting into getting into work where everything very often is can be quite chaotic Um, and then it's um, appreciate when you get in and you see the team first thing in the morning is straight away you can kind of feel if if it's a day where things are going a bit wrong or where it's nice and calm and things to be things seem to be under control and on the days where they are under pressure um i will help them out and i would clear some tables and i would put away their deliveries and i i will just do those little bits that don't mean a lot don't doesn't make my day more stressful or whatever but i would do those little things that makes a massive difference to them and and show them that I respect the fact that I can see that they're they're having a tough day um so and then I just enjoy seeing the teams I enjoy being with the teams and I'm I'm sure they can sense they can sense that I enjoy being around them and um being with them and chatting to them and say how's it going today and what's going on and who didn't show up today and who's sick and what's going on with your deliveries and just give them a hand and, and be with them I mean those are the days I enjoy the most is when I'm I'm with the teams. I really love that. I love I love the the thing about the routine because that's actually not boring in my view because that's actually where I also myself could actually manage going into whatever role I had. It was just an office director role. If I actually had my routines outside work and where I could really be in control of it and actually accept when I get to work, I'm probably not going to be in control of lots, but that's actually okay because I actually got my sleep and so on. I think like and you mentioned sleep and I think sometimes it's totally underrated when I got that in my early 30s the, the power of sleep and actually going to bed around 10 it became for me and now it's a bit earlier sometimes even because I have small children but uh, getting to bed early and getting up early you know that's like the because then you are ahead of yourself and you can better deal with because you know uncertainty will come you know chaos will hit you at some point something will change in your diary and actually if you have had that rest you can much better deal with it and then if you had time to prepare yourself for the day that's a, that's another thing so i really really don't think that's important i think actually it's quite essential in the world of 
you know, uncertainty, agility, or whatever we call it, pivoting all the time. It's quite cute. Um, one more question before we finish off for you. What is the, the one question you wish I've asked you today uh, and I didn't ask you? And what would it be and what would you have answered? I just think a lot of the time we don't talk about how freaking brilliant hospitality is. I mean, how much fun it is. It's a fun place to work. You know what I mean? It's fun. And the people you meet and if if you have what you need to do a good job and the interactions you can have with your customers and your regulars who come in, it's 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 supposed to be fun and people come to us um for a good time and for a pick me up or for what whatever it is. And we need to remember that 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 it's it's just a fun place to be and it's I've so many of my best friends are people I've worked with. Um, as in by far the majority of my best friends are people I've w- worked with and I've known for all the years I've been over here. And we've had some tough days at work where it was not fun and we were not friends. But at the end of the day, um, we survived it. And there's just something around environment and the team you work in, as in teamwork. And it's such a cliche to say it, but it's I think we sometimes forget that, yes, hospitality is tough and hard work and you can't ask customers to come back when it's less busy sort of thing. As in, you, you have to deal with the pressure. It's right in your face all the time. As in, you can't manage when people, customers come in. You have to just deal with it. But at, at the end of the day, it's just a fun, great place to be and it. Hospitality is just a br- brilliant industry and it teaches you a lot and you have a lot of laughs and you make friends for life. It's just, it's great. It's a, it was a very good, very good question because we have been so serious about hospitality for for some years now because we had just been in challenges. So we tend to talk about how we solve problems more than actually we forget actually to talk about how fun it is when you are in the flow and it goes well. Also, when it, the, the, the days are tough and the, 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 the friendships you create for that. And, and it's probably the same for me. Most of my really close friends uh, I've been in the trenches with at some point. And we had days where we didn't like each other a lot. <laughs> um, and especially one that probably would think out there, yeah, I know you're talking to me, Michael. Um, so so, so if people want to connect with you, Ria, and, um, and want to know more about you and uh, want to c- learn from, from you or just want to chat, how do they do that? What is the best way to, to, to find you? Um, I am on, I'm not on Twitter, so, um, but I am on LinkedIn, um, Re Lorenzen, and I am also on Instagram, which is um, Chef underscore Re. Anyone who would like to reach out or catch up, um, those are probably the two best ways to do it. Absolutely great! A, a pleasure to have you here today, Re. I'm so glad you wanted to to join the show and share your journey and your insights and your learnings with the audience. Uh, I send you power and energy for, for the journey ahead and uh, and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate that you're listening in. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, please share with others, rate or give a review or subscribe to one of our channels, which all can be done via the website hospitalitymavericks.com. I believe that reading the right books is the key to become a better leader. So I've helped you with a curated list of some of the best books to improve yourself, others, and the organization. Find them on hospitalitymavericks.com. A big thank you to BizSimply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help leaders to become better every day. Check them out at bizsimply.com or on their socials at bitsimply or bitsimply hq you can also email them directly at podcast at bitsimply.com thank you to fina charleston who is the show producer from the podcast collective if you have any ideas and feedback for the show or other thoughts reach out to me via linkedin or via my email michael at hospitalitymavericks.com i'm michael tinkser and you've been listening to the hospitality maverick podcast show Be Maverick.